Hi, I'm Travis and this is Curious Tangents. And as I'm speaking to you, the activity in my Broca's area associated with language production located here in the brain is increasing. Similarly, the activity in your Wernicke area associated with language comprehension is also increasing. What's more interesting than that though is if I could take a brain scan of everyone listening to this right now, you would all have similar brain waves. This is because of a property called neural entrainment. It's one of the reasons why when a group of people are at a concert listening to the same music or listening to a speech, they tend to move homogeneously. And it's also just one of the many ways that language shapes how you think. In my last video, we talked about the paraha of the Amazon who have at max 11 sounds in their language. There are a lot of cool things about this language, but one of the most relative to this question is that they're anumeric, meaning there are no words for numbers. Now, humans and many other animals can intuitively differentiate objects until there's about five of them. Past five, you're going to need a way to number things exactly. To us English speakers, that's just six, seven, eight. But if you don't have a way to do that, then you don't do that. And so cultures like the Paraha do not count. The discovery of this was used as strong support for a theory called linguistic determinism. Neology, or the coining of new words, is an interesting thing. We tend to think our phrases have been around forever, but they haven't. In fact, prior to 1975, there was no word for sexual harassment and this was a big deal. And for the people who went through this in their workplaces, typically women, this was a hindrance. Being that it's already difficult to talk about, and up to this point, there was no category for it. It almost never got talked about. The strong form of linguistic determinism says that you cannot think a thought if it cannot be put into words. And if you're a fan of this channel, you probably know why that's wrong, especially if you're a nonverbal thinker. See this video for more on that. Basically, there are people who don't think in any language at all, which is why having a large sample size is very important to scientific studies. In Western countries, when watching a play, you assume that the actors will enter from stage left. When you're putting together a timeline, you also tend to put the earliest events on the left and the latest ones, or the future, on the right. Now, this probably feels very intuitive and you don't question why you do it. I mean, it is just a timeline. But in cultures that write right to left, timelines and theatrical expectations move right to left. Schizophrenia is a mental disorder that affects about 1% of the population. Most of the population is bilingual completely unrelated statistics. In people who have schizophrenia and are bilingual, occasionally the auditory hallucinations only happen in one language. When that language is English, the typical description is aggressive and frightening, but when it's an Indian or African language, it's typically described as playful and childlike. The reasons for this are largely unknown, but links to the studies in the doobly-doo. But it might be because English is accusatory. If I fell down the stairs and I broke a bone, I would say something like, I broke my leg. Translating that directly to Spanish would make you sound like a person who intentionally breaks their own legs. If I wanted to say this in Spanish, it'd be mi pierno se rompo, or my leg broke. Notice that the person at fault is absent from the sentence. This might seem insignificant, but when studied, Spanish speakers tended to remember that events were accidents, whereas Americans Whereas English speaking Americans tended to remember who was at fault for the accidents. All of these things are examples of linguistic relativity, the other half of the Whorf hypothesis, or the idea that language plays a part in shaping your worldview and your culture. And this idea is not discredited unlike linguistic determinism. So that was supposed to be the end of the video, but I found two other things while I was researching linguistics that I thought might be helpful to someone watching. If you're trying to quit a bad habit, like say smoking or eating junk food, and someone does something like present you with chocolate cake and you say, I don't eat that versus I can't eat that, you are more than twice as likely to actually stick to your diet. The same goes with smoking. It's a significant change. The second is called semantic labeling or naming your feelings. You'll see it a ton in therapy. The idea is that in doing this, the negative feelings decrease and the positive feelings increase. It's not known why this happens, but you see it all the time in therapy and it does appear to work. Maybe because there's less uncertainty towards one's feelings or because you're accepting things about yourself, but feeling sad and then acknowledging that I am feeling sad 
tends to make you less sad. Conversely, being happy and then noticing that you're happy tends to make you happier. I think that last bit's important because a lot of times people are so ashamed of their feelings that they won't even acknowledge them to themselves. So if my last two videos were your introduction to this channel, I am not a life hack YouTuber, nor am I a linguistics YouTuber. I usually just pick in a topic every week, find all of the interesting parts in it, and then make videos about that. And if you like stuff like that, consider subscribing and liking the video. And thank you for watching.